Hey, this is Eric Dureck and welcome to this edition of Med Health Fit, the TV show that integrates wellness and healthcare. And we are on part two of our program on the Working Well program, which is essentially using exercise, integrative medicine and nutrition to help people who at work prevent injuries and recover for those injuries faster if they do get injured at the workplace. So we're gonna pick up where we left off in segment one, which is looking at aspects of injuries and safety programs. And we're gonna be talking just briefly about accident investigations because it's very important. And in the last segment, towards the end, I talked about, well, you know, people in health and wellness, they don't have to worry about that. And I say, well, you know, if you look at injuries in health clubs with fitness balls and dumbbells, yeah, you do have to worry about it. And you have to understand how people who actually do health and safety accident investigations for a living actually go about it. So let's look at here. Uh, they get details of what happened. They look at the medical information, but mostly they look at the factors that actually caused the accident. <clears throat> they want to detail the severity of that accident. Was it something very simple or was it something that's going to have to, you know, maybe go to court someday? Uh, they'll try to remedy the situation so there's less chance of it happening again. And this is really what I talked about in terms of health clubs. If you have fitness balls in the middle of a hallway, you, they need to be stacked. If you have yoga mats that are rolled up but they're not put away, they can also cause an injury. All right. So, Let's look at materials design. Um, I'm gonna try to, to pare this down to the health and wellness field, but um, people who are you know, working uh, uh, online, people who are working as custodians, some of them will re-engineer tools like uh, putting ramp on stairs or gates on trucks to load up equipment or something simple like this picture, putting grip, grippers on shoes. So when you're walking either on ice or you're walking in a very slippery building, the odds of you slipping and falling are reduced, not to zero, but they're reduced by quite a bit. So that's one of them, just redesigning materials. <clears throat> Another types of things in, for, for many people, especially those folks who drive for a living like chauffeurs, and we now have a lot of people driving Uber and Lyft uh, with their own cars, and people who drive for a living like truck drivers, UPS drivers in the post office, they need to take driver safety training. It allows them to reduce the risk of collisions, um, and they will do this on a biannual basis um, because being out even in a minor car accident with whiplash is going to cost the company a lot of money and it's also going to cost the worker a lot of time. So safe driving uh, programs are actually in quite a few different types of businesses. Aerial platform certification, and you're saying, I know what you're thinking, I would never do this. Well, you may be working with a worker who does work with aerial platforms because the people who do this are not just window cleaners, they're painters, they're custodians, they're HVAC workers, and other types of people, carpenters, they all use these types of units. And other workers like building maintenance workers, etc., they're all trained on these platforms. So we want to make sure that they do it safely. Another big thing here uh, with the advent of Costco and uh, the big Amazon plants is that uh, people are being trained on how to use a forklift. And if you've ever been to a, a big box store like Home Depot, they'll close off an aisle, they'll bring a guy in a forklift and he'll hoist up a big pallet of uh, wood or something, uh, you know, 30 feet off the ground. So it's a very dangerous occupation and it needs regular certifications and trainings in order for them to be safe. And most companies, whether they are <clears throat> working in manufacturing, whether they're working in transportation, or whether they, they are working in just office and administration, they like to have CPR training for all of their staff people. Uh, as a CPR <clears throat> trainer myself, I do people from lots of different types of businesses. And uh, surprisingly, most of the people that I work with are in the uh, administrative side as opposed to the um, um, you know, non-administrative uh, 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 side. You know, people who are truck drivers or landscapers or whatever, they get certified, but most of the people that I know, they're, they're working in an office building. Helps the staff be prepared for incidences, uh, and they understand a little bit about clinical situations in terms of uh, what would happen if someone actually did have a heart attack at their, in their building. Uh, there was an incident in Los Angeles years ago where a person who was working in a laboratory uh, was not using their lab coat, and um, some 
experiment they did caught on fire and uh, it burned them to death. So uh, laboratory safety training is very, very important for people who work in the industry uh, to guard against fires and spills, toxic agents, um, which most accidents that do happen in this realm happen with uh, reagents and chemicals. So there's lots of regular training for people in this area as well too. Uh, slips and falls is actually one of the top accidents in the workplace. Um, it can happen, injuries can happen throughout the body, lower extremities, hips, back, uh, neck, whiplash, anything. Uh, and it actually can be prevented through workplace measures. As I had mentioned before, the use of non-skid uh, materials in the shoes, um, use of signs, use of uh, taping off areas, and having people learn to walk around those areas as opposed to walking through them. Um, so there's a lot of training that goes on with that as well too. Uh, another thing is called lockout tagout, and most people in the health profession don't know what that is, but if there's something like a, um, an electric area that is unsafe or some other place that's unsafe, there's a, a, a truck, a car, a, um, some, some loading dock, something that's unsafe, and there's a way to get into that or there's a way to start it up, lockout tagout is the, is the thing that's used to actually make sure that no one can start that machine until it's deemed safe and inspected by someone probably from the Occupational self, uh, Health Administration. Um, so it's an area of true injury prevention uh, because you can't use it. There's no way that you can get around this if it's locked and tagged. So uh, people who do try to cut the locks off, they, are, they have very, very heavy fines from OSHA, and it would be just not very smart for them to do. Years ago, I went to a conference and I heard the term lift team. And coming from the sports realm, I thought, well, maybe these people are lifting weights. But in essence, what they're doing is they're lifting people from a bed to a gurney, or they're lifting them from a bed to a wheelchair. And nurses were having a lot of back injuries because a lot of them were not trained to lift people who weighed 150, 200, and sometimes even more from a bed to a gurney or vice versa. So a lot of hospitals uh, have been hiring lift teams where they have sort of big strong guys and big strong women too come in and they hire these people and uh, they will help to uh, take a person from point A to point B and they are actually trained in terms of moving that person in the best possible method so they themselves don't get hurt, but obviously they're not hurting the patient as well. So the difference between health promotion and health prevention, when you, when you have health promotion, uh, really is throughout programs and, and the research relating to a person's lifestyle and how it affects their health outcomes. Whereas health prevention looks at programs that are really looking to reduce the development of an acute or chronic disease uh, based on their health and, con and also in cost containment. So health prevention has two parts to it, the health aspect and, and the money aspect to it. And that's why we talk about these preventive aspects and things like certification training and, and all these things that workers do on a regular basis. So one of the things that's important in workers' compensation is what's called a risk analysis. So we want to look at a job and see how dangerous it is. It is. We want to look at a situation, see how dangerous it is. Uh, risk analysis is used to define techniques that identify factors that may jeopardize the success of a work project or increase the risk of injury to a person who's actually doing that. So that's one of the things about different types of work is that you have to be very cognizant of the fact that the work itself may be dangerous or like in the, in the case of a painter, they may be painting the first floor, but when, when they have to get up on scaffolding and do the 10th floor, the 20th floor, the, the risk analysis of that uh, is, is much, much higher. So OSHA has a program called DART, and it's called Days Away from Work, Restricted Duty, and Transfer of Duty. So that's what DART stands for. Um, so if a wellness program is successful, they will allow the staff to work longer without injuries, and they'd be back to work sooner from that injury. So they would have less days away. That's the, that's the DA part of DART. Um, they reduce the number of restricted days that they're on, all right? So they, they may be to work and they may be doing office work, but they would only do it for three days as opposed to a month uh, if a person is very seriously off. And the other thing is that they, they would be able to get back onto their own job description 
as opposed to transferring them either to another department or another type of job that they're able to do because it's, it's less, uh, is less physical and demanding job because of their injury. So the DART program is used and they can actually uh, calculate and they can look at the health outcomes of a person who's been injured and how many days away they are from work, how often they've had the restricted duty, and that they actually have to transfer to another job. Well, who are these workers? You know, I've been talking about the different people who may be at risk for a specific type of injury or whatever, but well, let's look at skilled trades, people who are construction workers, people who are painters and carpenters and plumbers, people who are HVAC or heating uh, and air conditioning, uh, people who are electricians, people who are truck drivers or other types of drivers who have to be in the seat for long periods of time. They have a high degree of hazard in their work days uh, and then their jobs have to be stratified based on the danger. So someone who's uh, maybe working for a landscape company that has to be up 30 feet cutting limbs off of trees, very dangerous job. People who's, who are doing trash collection who have to lift these heavy barrels and they have to lift them in an awkward position time after time after time, that's a very dangerous job. So, um, and even cooks with, with uh, working, uh, you know, by high heat and all these things. So there's lots of different types of jobs and all those jobs are risk stratified. But we also want to look at the age of the worker because an older worker may be at more risk because of their, uh, their age and their um, physical situation. Any previous injuries or surgeries that that worker has had, the type of certifications or licensures that they have to have for their profession, the amount of continuing education they have every year, which is important, and the safety habits that they have. Uh, people like to stay up all night. We now know that uh, not getting a lot of sleep is a very dangerous thing in terms of many jobs. And a lot of people will restrict the workers time in doing a specific job if they know that they have not had the right amount of sleep. So safety habits are very important. One of the things that I think is also important is posture. And we can see this now because uh, a lot of companies now have sit-stand desks. They have people walk around during meetings instead of sitting. Uh, so poor muscle tone uh, is related to muscle weakness. It's the number one issue related to chronic health problems is poor posture. And that could be slouching, which is your sitting or your standing posture, or your mechanical issues. Like you may have, um, as seen in the picture here, you may have scoliosis. You may have kyphosis. You may have uh, weak muscles on both sides. And if you do, you are at greater risk for having an injury over time. So let's define ergonomics because I've, I've thrown that word out a couple times. And ergonomics is basically how the body is operating in relation to its external environment. And in many people, that environment is their job. So uh, extrinsic ergonomics is the size and shape of your desk, the type of sit-stand desk you use, the keyboard you use, the mouse that you use, all of these external factors that help you do your job. And many of these things are very highly successful in getting people to, to work better with less pain. But I'm also a big fan of an intrinsic ergonomics, which is I define as the body's adaptation to the workplace and the training environment, and the body becomes better suited to the work independent of any of the external designs. And I think that this is akin to training because dumbbells, barbells, and a lot of weight machines haven't changed that much in the last 100 years because you still have to lift the weight, so the body has to get accustomed to that. So I break down ergonomics into two different areas, how your desk and how your external situation work, but how are you built physically to actually be in that environment for a long period of time. Ergonomics looks at minor posture issues, but mostly the retooling of machines. So the study of ergonomics is mostly involved with extrinsic components, whereas I think that the intrinsic things have to do with exercise, health and fitness and whatever, and then they will, they will sort of carry over to the uh, work environment. So let's look at our next chapter, therapy programs. So a person uh, has been injured on the job, what are their resources? Uh, claims are dealt with on an individual basis. Most programs see a doctor only. So most roads from a, an injury have to do with what am I gonna do with the doctor? Am I gonna go to 
a clinic? Am I going to go to a hospital? What kind of procedures am I going to have done? Um, what defines an information only injury, which is maybe someone has a cut on their hand, they wash it, they put on an ointment, and they have a bandage, that's an information only. As opposed to someone that, well, that cuts deep enough where we have to go to occupational medicine or the emergency room. So there's lots of things here that people need to, to look at in terms of what they're going to do with this injury. But the need for an intermediary position in risk management to deal with these things is very important. And these things may be someone from HR who is an injury prevention person or they are a health and safety person and they're looking at these things specifically on a daily basis. So let's look at a couple different types of things that, that are usually seen in the workplace. And the first one is cuts. Laceration that opens the skin causes a little blood loss. Most people are familiar with that. If it's small enough, they wash it out, they put a bandage on, and they go back to work. If it's large enough, they're going to the, the hospital or the occupational medicine center for stitches. Uh, muscle strains and pra sprains, the most common forms of injuries. Either you're uh, straining the muscle or you're spraining a ligament. Uh, causes bruising, swelling, and in some people, a lot of pain. So some people may have ice, go back to work, but for many of these types of injuries, because of the pain levels involved, they're going to be off work for a, a particular period of time. Now, a puncture is a little bit different than a cut. Uh, when I say a cut, it usually is, is a slashing uh, wound uh, on the skin, whereas a puncture is something that actually kind of pokes into an into a, a area of the body. And the deeper it gets underneath the skin, the more dangerous it becomes. And the last one is repetitive strain injuries. And anybody who sat on a, at a computer for a long period of time or anyone who's had to work on an assembly line for a long period of time knows that if you do something time and time and time again without rest, chances are, even if you're in good physical health, you may have some problems with a musculoskeletal injury down the road. So these are kind of the four, I'm going to call the four big types of injuries that are seen especially at the, in the administrative workplace. And those are the ones that are usually dealt with. For cuts, it's important to know how much bleeding there is. That's your, your, your biggest uh, um, visualization there is if a person's bleeding a lot, the wound is deep, uh, or, or the gash is long, chances are they're going to be taken to the hospital or the emergency room. For muscular skeletal sprains and strains, you want to locate the area that it is in the body and you want to figure out how much pain that that person is dealing with. Because um, they may not have a strain in the muscle, they may have actually have a strain in the ligament, which is going to take much longer to heal. And the only way that you're going to know that is to have either an x-ray or an MRI CT at a doctor's office so you can actually get a pretty good diagnosis to make sure that you know what the next steps are. And usually those steps are physical therapy and some other type of post therapy with the staff at, at your location. Puncture wounds, as I said, uh, they can be very serious uh, depending on where the body that, the, uh, that they uh, occur in. Um, and like I say, a patient is usually taken by a staff person directly to the hospital to detail the type of, of injury. And if it's been something like a needle or if it's been something larger that's punctured into the body and uh, how much blood that there is and did it do something terrible like, you know, hit it an uh, artery uh, deep in the body. So that's something also that's probably going to be something that it's going to, going to the hospital. And lastly, the, the repetitive strain injuries. Um, you know, if you have someone who's using a hammer or a mouse or something like that, they're two different types of of instruments, but they may have the same type of thing in terms of carpal tunnel or Quavon syndrome or um, repetitive strain with the elbow. They may get a tennis elbow or something of that nature. Um, and this is something that, that you have to have an acute th uh, therapy program for with physical therapy, whether it's ice, electrical stim, etc. And then you have to have a long-term program where you're training that person to use the object again in a different way whether you're, they're switching hands or they're doing something or they have uh, work to rest breaks that are a little bit different than they had uh, when they got injured. So you're really trying to deal with these things, not just from the acute standpoint, because that's going to be taken care of from, with doctors and, and allied health therapists, but it's something that how can we prevent this long, you know, long down the road. So for therapy program for cuts, we know that first aid, 
Uh, you've got to glove up. You want to make sure that you're using the right types of gauze and, and pressure on the wound. Staff needs to be on restricted movement if they've had stitches. Uh, and they need really time to sort of get back into uh, learning how to use the tools, especially if they've had any type of surgical procedure or something uh, to repair that cut. And of course, they're going to be following up with a doctor on a regular basis. So uh, for repetitive strain injuries, uh, I think that massage therapy and stretching are two of some of the best programs that can be done for workers. So if you've got low back, hand, neck, shoulders, feet, etc., to decrease the pain and improve the circulation, myself and others recommend massage therapy. And then to make sure that you strengthen those areas, we're, we want to have uh, stretching and strengthening programs and sometimes the stretching programs can be done right on the job. So someone cuts their finger at work and it's not very bad. They're not going to go to the doctors. The wound is dry. It's been cleaned. It's, uh, it's been bandaged. We'll write up a report that says information only, which means this person was cut. We'll try to investigate, remedy the situation. Maybe there was some weird thing in the kitchen. There was some extra knives in the sink that shouldn't have been there. That will get remedied. But if a person needs medical attention, that type of claim is something that not only that the, uh, the, the director, the supervisor, someone would have to help fill out with, these, with the staff person, but the doctor will also have to be involved with that in terms of their written report. So depending on the severity of the injury, you'll either have an information claim or you'll have a medical claim. Okay? In many cases, the work comp problems may be referred to physical therapy for hopefully at least 12 sessions. And in other cases, uh, the worker, the, the employee is referred to a specialty practitioner, maybe a surgeon or a neurosurgeon, or if it's a diet-related program, they're going to be referred to a dietitian or a nutritionist. Uh, if they are, they're going to need an authorization form, and that's going to be the name of the employee, the type of injury, the initial medical treatment, uh, the type of referral that they received from their doctor, and maybe the number of sessions that they're, they're going to have, either for the dietitian or for the physical therapist. So the first aid treatment is very critical, all right? Um, I would say that in most types of businesses, they should have first aid training. Uh, and that might go along with their CPR training. And uh, those classes are usually offered by companies such as the Red Cross. And I think that they are invaluable in terms of those information onlys to make sure that the person is, is um, uh, the wound is cleaned, uh, it's dressed, and they can go back to their work uh, knowing that the, the right type of first aid has been given for whatever type of injury that they've had. So the next chapter I want to talk about is cost savings. And I said I wanted to say that, that you know, injury prevention, the preventive aspects of wellness don't just deal with issues with the body, they also deal with issues in terms of cost. And in most businesses, especially in manufacturing type businesses, production businesses where they have injuries, over time they work with their insurance companies on what's called a rate product. And it's essentially a tax. The more injuries you have, the higher your rate product. And uh, many large organizations and self-insured companies, a rate product is a tax for every $100 of payroll that's used to pay for a worker's compensation through, through that payroll money. So like uh, RP, um, they would use something like an experience modification. And this is another issue um, in, for the rate product where based on that $100, you're going to pay a certain amount of money. And usually what they will do is their baseline claims is a dollar. So if, you're, if your baseline claim for a dollar for every 100, if you have more injuries, your X mod may go to $1.25, it may go to $1.50, it may go to $2. If you have an X mod that's uh, $303.50 or $7, you have a very high uh, modification rate and the goal of these injury prevention and wellness programs is to get that X mod down as close to a dollar or maybe even less than a dollar as you can and that has to do with two things reducing the total amount of injuries that you have with your employees and reducing the severity of those injuries so if a person does have an injury they're back on the job in a relatively short period of time 
and this has to do with the severity of accidents. Uh, they can be calculated by the total amount spent on medical treatments and the total number of days off that are recruited by the employee from that accident. So again, your XMOD, if it's a very severe accident and they're off work for a long period of time, that also goes into the calculation and that $1 figure goes up and up and up for some company. Uh, the body parts that affected, the, the most people know that in California uh, who are experienced in, um, in the, these the workers' compensation issues know that the average cost and care of a back injury is around $58,000. So if you can get, uh, if you know what body part is affected and you know that you can have a certain amount of treatment that can bring that person back quickly, then um, you're going to have a, a much better cost savings next time around. And I think that there is a formula. I think that if you can get a lot of your people who are at high risk of something like a back injury, get them into an exercise program, a health club membership, uh, have them be involved with some specialty programs like weight loss, massage therapy, I think that you're going to see these X mods and all of these things that have to do with the, the, the total amount of money spent uh, become less and less over time. So let's take two different people. We're going to, uh, fictitious names, uh, Davis and Margolis. One is a groundskeeper, and he has a doctor's visit on February 1st. The total office visit was $150, and they did a procedure with him, which was $350. So his total cost is $500. But our custodian, same day, goes to see a doctor, same cost for the office visit, but he's having another type of procedure, which is almost $600. So his total procedure is about $250 more than the groundskeeper. And so what we want to do is we want to track the type of, of procedure that is going on with both of these people. Maybe the same type of injury or maybe a little different severity of injury, but we can tell from this graph by the, 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 the person who has the more expensive procedure, they may be having more intense work that's being done. So this is another way that we can track this. And another way is when do, when do they return to their do their duties and this is agreed upon by the workers comp by the insurance people and by the occupational medicine people and the doctors and maybe what we'll do is we'll put those workers on what's called modified duty and that duty is going to make sure that they can be on the job and they can be productive for a little bit of time until their their doctor deems them safe they're healthy they're without pain they're ready to get back to work so this is part two of our series on workers' compensation and wellness. And for MedHealthFit, this is Eric Dirac. Thanks for watching and tune in to part three. And if you have any questions, you can log on to the website and you can, you can have a conversation about it. So thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next segment.